Good morning. Hosanna, let our praise resound. What a great thing to say together this morning on this Palm Sunday. Hosanna, let our praise resound. Let's stand as we sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings, who have come to praise this morning. Let's lift our voices.
Luke 19, verse 28 says, After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they'd seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away?
Lord, we lift your name on high in this place right now. Lord of all majesty, Hosanna in the highest. We praise your name because of what you have already done for us. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you gave it all for us. So that's our prayer this morning as we give you our praise is that we would lay down our lives in return, that we would give ourselves for your kingdom, that what breaks your heart would break our heart too. I pray that you'll continue to soften our hearts and draw us close to you as we praise your name this morning, as we lift you up in worship. And may we understand the true meaning of Palm Sunday, the King of glory riding on a donkey, the King of glory coming so that we could have life in all its fullness, life eternally. Thank you for what you have done for us. And we praise your name right now in this place. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. You might like to take your seats. That's, that's the introduction to kids' time. <laughs> that's your cue. Everybody come down. <laughs> All right. I thought I'd just make light of that for you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. There's lots of kids here today. We can see them. We can hear them. We love them. They keep us on our toes, especially our own. Come on down. Oh, Nikita, you're getting into the thing. You got a palm branch this morning. And I saw Jacob's got a palm shirt. I think that deserves a clap. He's going really into the theme this morning. Did you plan that? <laughs> you just did it by yourself. You didn't even know. That's pretty crazy. All right. I noticed we're one step ahead of the grown-ups, which is pretty cool. Because if you saw the video, 
asked, what, were they, what was happening in the video earlier this morning? Um, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and all the people were, all the people were excited and placing palm, palm leaves. Excellent. So we actually started learning about that about four or five weeks ago, grown-ups, because we wanted to fit all of our lessons in before the Easter break. So does anyone have exciting news? I've got exciting news. We're heading into the last week of school for those who are about to be on school holidays, which means we're heading into Easter. Anything else? On Thursday, it's Joe's birthday. On Thursday, it's Joe's birthday. Oh, I know someone else having a birthday in the Easter holidays too. Zachary. Any other news? My son's February. Yours is in February. So you've already had yours. <gasps> That's lucky. You've got to wait a whole nother almost year. Okay, well, I've got some exciting news. I need to talk to you about the Easter Family Fun Day. So if you haven't heard about this in your family, and it's not just for families, anyone's invited. We are having on Saturday an Easter family fun day. We are going to Porter's Paddock Park. I don't expect you to remember that, but it's at Tingalpa, so we'll let your parents know. And it's the really cool park where the, aer the model aeroplanes fly, so we can watch those as well. We're gonna have soccer, we're gonna have cricket, we're gonna have fun, we're gonna have yard games, we're gonna have we're going to meet with our Bayside church friends. So it's not just you guys. There's going to be lots of kids there. We're going to have a picnic. You have to bring your own picnic. But we are going to supply the yummy treats for the Easter egg hunt. So we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. That's at 9 o'clock next Saturday. It is a holiday. We'll have to get up pretty early. Yep. So if you haven't got a flyer for that, anyone can come along to that. Okay, for Kids Church today, before we go out, before we say our prayer, let's tell the grown-ups what we're going to be learning about. So what, who can remember, I know Jacob always remembers, I'm going to ask somebody else, who can remember, what did we learn about last Sunday? I'll give you a clue. It's something that's coming up this Friday. We're not going to school, we're not going to childcare, we're not going to work. It's a special holiday for a special day. The school holiday. That's starting as well after this special day. Good Friday. Good Friday. And what did we learn about Good Friday last week? Lockie, what happened? It was something really sad that we talked about in our Easter storybook. What was the really sad thing? Jesus died. Jesus died on the cross. We learned about... He was arrested in the garden. Remember, he was betrayed by Judas. He was arrested in the garden and they hung him on a cross to die. So what do you think we might be talking about today? It's something happening on Sunday, this coming Sunday. It's really confusing. Easter. Easter Sunday. So today, because you're all tired and close to holidays got some treats out at Kids Church today. I really like chocolate. I can have a little bite. See if it still tastes okay. Mm. It is really good. A bit more. Mm -hmm. Mm. Hang on a minute. I was expecting some caramel or some strawberry. <gasps> or who likes those Cadbury cream eggs? They're my favourite. The ones that are filled with caramel cream. Mmm, delicious. But what's inside my egg today? What's inside my egg? Chocolate. Oh, chocolate around the outside. What's on the inside? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing? I got ripped off. Aaron Jones. <laughs> It's hollow. It's hollow. So today, you might remember last year, some of you that were here, we did the special Easter egg story with the, with the um, plastic eggs. And inside the white egg, it was empty. Why is my egg empty? How would we use that in kids' church today? Nothing. It's empty. What's empty? In the, the chocolate egg. egg. What's empty? Yeah, but we're thinking about the Easter story. The tomb. The tomb. 
today we're learning about the empty tomb. And if you're super well behaved, you're going to get to make a special cooking activity today using the hollow egg to represent on a special biscuit. And I can see the people who I'm not going to let have icing <laughs> today using the biscuit with an egg on top, and you're going to get to bring one home for, back to your families as well, to represent that the tomb was empty and Jesus is... Oh, Brad got the answer. Alive. Come on. Brad's going to get a chocolate after church for that. The tomb was empty and Jesus is alive. So that's what we're going to learn about today. And if you can come back and show your grown-ups your awesome cooking activity that you did and tell them Jesus is alive after Kids Church. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Shh, let's quiet our hearts. Shh, not yet, Lily. Not yet, we've got to pray first. Shh. Dear God, I thank you today for all of our amazing children. I thank you for each one of them, Lord for the gifts that you've given them and the personalities that you've given them, God. And I pray we'll quiet our hearts now as we go to learn about our Easter story at Kids Church, that we would have enjoy some treats, but most importantly, we can remember on Easter Sunday when we open our chocolate eggs that we can remember the tomb was empty and you are alive. And I pray this morning that we'll have awesome listening ears, that we'll be able to take the story and the word of God into each of our hearts, even the grown-ups, and we'll have fun and we'll sing worship songs, God, that talk about the real meaning of Easter. So we thank you as we celebrate next weekend that you would have something special for each of these children and each member of our church as well. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can line up nicely for Kids Church. Thanks, Megan. Um, I was talking to Fawn earlier. Fawn, what's those chocolates that are really tasty? What are they called? Carob. If anyone wants a free carob chocolate, we can make that available. Apparently, they're not that great, but that's okay. It's the alternative to real chocolate, it seems. But um, it's great to see the kids, and thank you for the team for helping them learn and grow through those experiences of Christ and the stories and the unfolding revelation of who Jesus is. Uh, friends, I hope that you can make Easter. The, uh, the program is out. It's been publicised Thursday night here at 7pm, Friday as well on 9.30, Good Friday. We also have Saturday, which Luke spoke about, Sunday back here at 9.30. So we hope that you can make time to connect in that way and, and invite people to come. Anyone uh, in your network to come out would be great. Um, thank you for those who volunteered this week. Thursday was a time at Bunnings where we volunteered for the crew there who were putting on a community event. Thanks for those that came down to help out. It was a great space. Uh, we've got another one coming up, I think, for Mother's Day. Do you know Mother's Day was coming up? Apparently it is. There's another event at Bunnings Mother's Day, so we'll throw that out there. Uh, we've also got Anzac Day coming up and some preparations for the band around Anzac Day, so continue to pray for our witness and our influence in that space as well. We have, in a long time, well, not so long time, Red Shield coming up. Who's aware of Red Shield? It's on the calendar in May, so you get plenty of opportunities to serve and to support our local mission, really. Everything that we're able to connect with and raise during that appeal uh, predominantly stays within the, in the mission work that we do in Carindale, which is fantastic. Um, so please consider what you might do in that space as well. What's exciting is, is the, uh, there's so many resources these days for us to tap in in a discipleship journey, to tap into God's truth and, and to, to figure out um, as, as a community what he's saying to each of us. So there's a, there's a link in the newsletter uh, for Easter with a version link leading into holy work. There's a version, a Bible app-based uh, readings and, and, and questions that you can respond to if you want to do that. So please check out the newsletter for those details. Anyone who has trouble linking with that, come and let us know. The Salvation Army nationally has also brought out a, a, a devotional for Holy Week as well. We have some hard copies for this one and we can also share uh, the e-copies, electronic copies with you if you want that. So let's, uh, let's embrace the opportunity that we have to kind of, um, yeah, learn and, and saturate ourselves with, with the story of, of Easter. Uh, even though we know it, the beauty of God is he's, he's, he's dynamic. It's almost like a God who can be known, but a God who is ever mysterious and that we need to delve into uh, each moment of each day. 
We're going to read from Mark now. We've had some different scriptures this morning, but we're going to read from Mark's gospel, continuing to journey with Mark's gospel from chapter 11 today. And it's the similar reading. Uh, it's a reading of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, Mark chapter 11. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches as they, as they, uh, that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God grant us understanding. As we continue in worship, I invite you to take on a posture of worship. You might like to stand, you might like to kneel, you might like to dance, however you feel comfortable. Let's sing this song about Jesus, our Messiah, who became sin so that we could have eternal life.
you might continue to open our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds to understand, to know, and to love you more. To hear your word and to put it into action. And Lord, we pray this morning that you guide Brad as he leads and that what he shared would, shares would touch our hearts so that we may know you more. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hosanna, save us. I don't know this morning what you need saving from, but we're going to spend some time on that this morning. Do you know the story uh, about... Uh, Jesus coming into a town. It's interesting, actually, that quite a number of times Jesus uh, comes into town and, and, and encounters people and, and does healings at the city gates and all sorts of stuff. But um, I'm always amazed at um, the gospel writers and what they choose to focus on in the retelling of Jesus' life. And here we see a story about Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if anyone's written a story about when you came back into Brisbane lately. Did anyone send out the fanfare and the mayor get in touch and welcome you at all? But it's, it's a story about a, a guy coming into Jerusalem and what the crowds do in response to Jesus. And it's picked up in all four Gospels. Again, not all the stories about Jesus' life were picked up across all the Gospels. This one was. And if we want to get a sense of what it's all about, it's, it's really helpful to read from even Mark 10. And a few weeks ago, you might remember when Adele spoke, she talked about a guy called Bartimaeus. Who remembers that story about a blind man, Bartimaeus, being healed? And in the story of Bartimaeus, about Jesus healing this blind man, Bartimaeus, we can think to ourselves, it's just another miracle story, one of many that Jesus did, just another incredible miracle story. And it is incredible how it impacted and transformed his life, this encounter. But what's incredible is what this blind man says. And if you remember what Adele spoke about, this blind man declared towards Jesus that he was the son of David. Couldn't see him, couldn't see him, but he knew in his heart and his mind somehow that he was the son of David. And he says, King, son of David, King, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. We see in that moment a declaration that was echoed. And in this story, as he comes into Jerusalem, we see the first time that Jesus has allowed this title, this title of King, Son of David, to be declared freely and loudly and publicly. Often when people echo this in sentiments or whatever, he was saying, don't declare this. You know, go on your way, but don't talk about this. It's called the Messianic Secret. But here we see, as he enters Jerusalem on this occasion, he allows the crowds to freely and loudly and publicly declare, declare this. He allows them to reveal his, his identity, to broadcast it aloud for all to hear. And the crowd shouts it, and they shout it. And Jesus, in a sense, just, just looks over. You can imagine, he just looks over, and he nods and he waves. No remonstration, no minimization. He just nods and waves. And he says to them, in a sense, yes, that's me. That's me. The promised Messiah, the promised King. Now, for the disciples who had journeyed with Jesus uh, for a number of years now, very closely, who time and time again, just when they thought, let's broadcast this, let's make this public, and he says, no, not yet. Time and time again, Jesus had kind of enabled them or he had dissuaded them from doing this. And here, they're looking on and they're seeing he's not dissuading this. He's not dissuading this at all. Their agenda over the months was for him to declare this, to declare that he was a king, that he was the promised Messiah, but he didn't want this. But such for such a time as this, now he does. Jesus says, yes, it's true, I am the deliverer. The impetus, friends, at this part of the story, the impetus of the journey of Jesus in mission, the momentum has shifted in this moment. The momentum has shifted in this moment. It's like game on in a new way. Jesus was entering the epicenter of, of Judaism, the capital, of, of, of Israel, the place of the sacred temple, a political hotbed under Roman rule. The crowds were beseeching him as their king, their saviour, and this was, in a sense, in defiance of the religious leaders and the emperor. What they were saying 
was almost t- t- tyranny, tyrannical. What they were saying was tyrannical. This was no random, spontaneous scene. This was no rhetoric of happenstance. It's actually a revelation of Jesus taking ultimate charge. Jesus is bringing these events to bear. And whatever is happening in your life at times, friends, I want to encourage you that Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is bringing these events to bear. He's moving things towards the opus of his earthly mission, and it happens quickly. We know, again, the volume of, of account in the, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels and what's dedicated to this particular Holy Week. It's significant, the amount of volume that's dedicated in the Gospels for this one week. He's moving things towards the opus of his earthly, message, of his earthly mission. This is a staged arrival in Jerusalem, and he's now intentionally drawing attention to himself. He's now intentionally drawing attention to himself where once he sought to elude the star-struck crowds whose excitement threatened to turn his mission into a circus show, because that's what can happen, where once he tried to hush those who championed his name without fully understanding who he was and dampening the aspirations of those who saw only visions of glory and worldly rewards, unable to conceive the signs along the way that was always pointing towards suffering and sacrifice. What happens here is a complete reversal. He now encourages the crowds to beckon his name, son of David, king. The atmosphere is charged with the heartbeat of Passover. We know that. It's charged with the heartbeat of Passover. Deliverance is tangible, palpable, insatiable in the minds and hearts of the Jewish people. Passover is about deliverance. Deliverance was insatiable in the hearts and minds of the people. Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, Deliver us from what? From what? Well, we know their their view of this was still so very different to what Jesus had in mind. For the people, they longed to be delivered just as they had been in slavery from Egypt. They longed to be delivered. Save us, son of David, king. Save us. But Jesus, in every detail of the story, is revealing what sort of king he is what sort of salvation he is bringing about and mark tells us as do the other writers that jesus comes via bethphage and bethany and if you know anything about these two small towns uh, bethany was the home of mary and martha and lazarus they were very close friends of jesus jesus had stayed there this is a place that jesus hung out in a fair bit Bethany was on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives and only a few k's from Jerusalem. In fact, Bethany was so close to Jerusalem, every Saturday you could do a park run from Bethany to Jerusalem. And you still have two k's to go. So it was really close, really close. And no other crowd um, understood Jesus better. Jesus knew the village well. He knew who owned the animals. He knew the village well. It was a small village and he knew who owned the animals where the animals were, were, and he was intimately aware of many of the details of this town. And no other, no other crowd, no other crowd of people knew Jesus better, aside from probably the disciples. The people in these places knew Jesus well. They knew about Jesus' power. They'd seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, and, and they knew him well. And he instructs two of his intimate disciples to go and grab a specific donkey. Go and grab a donkey from out front of this house. You know, when you think about the story, surely he had some sort of arrangement. I don't know about you, but I'm not in the habit of going and picking up donkeys from people's houses and just taking them. <sighs> imagine, imagine doing that for somebody's pet. I'm just going to go grab the pet and I'll bring it back later. Just let them know. Just let them know. It just doesn't happen. Surely he had some sort of arrangement. Why would he just go and take a donkey? But Jesus, in all his grace and in humility, he actually says to the disciples, make sure, make sure you let them know that I'm going to be riding it. Make sure that you let them know that I'm going to be riding it and it will be returned later. It will be returned later. Jesus is not a king, even though he should be in some ways or could be. He's not a king who lives entitled, laying claim and taking whatever he wants whatever he wants. Even in this interaction, we can, we can see uh, the considerate Jesus, the humble Jesus, a man with integrity. Let them know that I'm grabbing this donkey. I need it for a while. 
but it will come back. The large crowds, they lay down their cloaks, they lay down uh, branches, as we know about the story, uh, and they, they gather themselves from Bethany and Bethpage. Where did the large crowd come from? It wasn't out of Jerusalem, necessarily. It was coming in from these places, Bethpage and Bethany. The people arrive with the donkey, in a sense, following Jesus, declaring who Jesus is. They knew Jesus well. And Jesus chooses the donkey. He's directing all of this again. He's directing everything that's unfolding. The disciples buoyed by what they see. The master is allowing the crowds to declare that he is king, this tyrannical, uh, this tyrannical label. They're buoyed by this because they think that Jesus is finally staking his authority as king who will now overthrow Every time they see the fullness of the power of Jesus, every time they saw the fullness of the power of Jesus, the power over evil spirits, the power over nature, the power over sickness, the power over death, ultimately, they want him to tear down the Roman oppressors and go all out. It's a natural extension of power, surely, that he would free them from their situation, being in bondage under foreign rulers. Here is the moment, they're thinking. Finally, here is the moment. Here's our chance to fight fire with fire. It's insurrection time. It's time for a revolution, for all the hordes of heaven to be unleashed. And what does Jesus do? He rides in on a donkey. He rides in on a donkey. No war horse. No war horse. He rides in on a donkey. Friends, Jesus often does things that we don't expect often does things that we don't expect, often does what we don't predict, often does things that are in contrast to what we think he should. Jesus isn't doing it right. Jesus is not doing it right. For the disciples, this is kind of a PR nightmare. Jesus would be a PR nightmare. Who'd want to be the PR manager for Jesus? (laughs) No thanks. Um, Jesus, you're never going to win an American presidency election race doing it this way. You're never going to win doing it this way. He's sending these mixed messages. King, save us. What's with the donkey? We know enough from the commentaries and and the other gospels as well that Matthew, it it says itself, behold, your king comes to you gentle. He comes to you gentle. And when I think about God and the gentle nature of God, which we've talked about previously, um, he is gentle, he is humble, but he's also not modest. He's humble, he's gentle, but he's not modest. He's loving, he's tender, he's compassionate in his service with others. But he also does make incredible claims about himself and who he is. He didn't want it promoted, but he makes incredible claims about himself and who he is. And we see that, that even later on, we're going to talk about that, but later on after the story, he goes into the house, the temple, the house of God, and he starts rearranging the furniture, right? And you'd only do that if you're in charge, right? Jesus himself is in charge. He is God incarnate. He makes some incredible plans. He's humble, but he's not modest. modest. And, he, and he says to us today, friends, that either I'm king of all or I'm not king at all. I'm king of all. I'm not king at all. He says, in a sense, crown me or kill me. Crown me or kill me. All or nothing. We know enough from Revelation and, 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 uh, and the book of Revelation that, that God abhors lukewarmness. God abhors lukewarmness. When we, we kind of have a foot in, in both camps, so we don't really stand for anything. He's either king of all, he's not king at all. And there's this really humorous story in Acts 19, uh, verses 13 to 16. It's the sons of Sheba's story, the sons of Sceva's story. Um, They hear, these sons of Sceva, this band of disciples they're labeled as the sons of Sceva, they hear that Paul is doing great things in the name of Jesus. These guys hear that Paul is doing great things in the name of Jesus. So they say to this guy who was demon-possessed, they say, in the name of Jesus, you know the one that Paul preaches... I cast you out. In the name of Jesus, you know the one that Paul preaches about? I cast you out. Their thinking is that the name of Jesus is what's in the power. The power is in the name of Jesus, the rhetoric of the name of Jesus. And as the story unfolds, the demon-possessed man, the demon, the evil spirits within the man, looks at the seven sons and, and he says, 
Jesus I know, <laughs> it's quite funny, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who in God's name are you? <laughs> it's interesting. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who in God's name are you? The man with the evil spirit, then, you know what happens? The man jumps on the seven sons, he basically bashes them, <laughs> and they run away. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. That's terrible. Anyway, I think it's funny, but it's not funny. Right? They, they, he, they run, he runs away. They run away naked and bleeding. This is what happens. They run away naked and bleeding. What is that story all about? What is it all about? In the name of Jesus, they declare, you know, the one that Paul talks about, it has no effect. In the name of Jesus, it had no effect for them. They knew something about Jesus, the one that Paul talks about, but they did not know Jesus. They did not know Jesus. Jesus. The power of Jesus, friends, is not magic to be concocted. It's not prescribed words to be recited. It's not mechanical. It's kingly power. And even in this story of entering Jerusalem, Jesus is revealing this. It's kingly power. And unless you're submitting to the name of Jesus, there is no power. Unless you are submitting yourself to the name of Jesus, there is no power. We may cry, Son of David, save us, but do we live as if Jesus is our King, our Lord and Saviour? If you're asking for Jesus' help or strength today by invoking his name and yet you are not submitted to him, then it's fantasy. It's fantasy. Jesus' power manifests itself through submission. Jesus' power manifests itself through submission. Jesus comes gentle riding on a donkey. And another interesting detail about the story is it talks about that, that this donkey had never been ridden. Number, not only am I not going to people's places and just taking their donkeys, donkeys randomly, I'm not going to jump on a donkey that's ever been ridden. Who would do that? Who would just jump on a donkey that had never been ridden? Anyone there? Nobody would give it a go even, just to see what would happen? Huh. I would cheer you on. I'm curious to see what would happen. I'd cheer you on. This donkey had never been ridden, and yet... As the story unfolds, it submits to the Lordship of Jesus. Even in this moment, we have an animal submitting to the Lordship of Jesus. The gentle power of Christ to tame, to bring order, even within this animal. We know that, that donkeys themselves were appropriate for royal and religious use. This, this was a symbolic thing of royalty coming in. This donkey itself, the symbolism is that it was untouched. It had never been written untouched. It was a symbolism of sacrifice. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, riding on an unblemished, untouched, unridden donkey. And there were prophecies in the Old Testament that declared all of this. Zechariah 9, the king comes to you gentle. gentle. Genesis 49 even talked about a great king. Way back in the beginning, a great king making things ultimately right. But knowing what the people were facing and what they were expecting, who comes on a donkey at a time like this, riding a vulnerable, defenseless animal? The disciples kind of knew that any king who comes like this in a time of war would not last five minutes. That's what they're thinking through worldly eyes. This is going nowhere. What is happening? Jesus is saying, again, I'm a king but not like you think. Friends, in our lives, in our world today, for many of us, the driving force, the impulse of our purpose and our meaning is self-preservation, self-satisfaction, and self-edification. Self-preservation when we're desperate, self-satisfaction uh, when we want things, and self-edification, seeking attention. And Jesus knew, Jesus knew that what we needed saving from most Back then, wasn't the Roman emperor, it wasn't the Roman authorities. Jesus knew that what we needed saving from most was saving from ourselves. Saving from ourselves. And I wonder if that's true of us today. What do you need saving from? In a very temporal and real, real way, some of us have life pressures, whether it's accommodation, whether it's family, whether it's health, whether it's other concerns that are legitimate and significant. But from your heart of hearts, what do you need saving from today? Jesus entered Jerusalem uh, in verse 11. So after he's come through, he entered Jerusalem. And you know where he goes? After he hears the crowds and after he enters, he goes to, Mark tells us, the temple. 
He goes to the temple courts. He looks around at everything, scopes it out. But since it was already late, it says, he returns back to Bethany with the 12. An interesting sequence of events. He goes back to where they just come from, a few Ks down the road. He enters with this drama and fanfare and declarations of being king. The, 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 the crowd almost fever pitch in their hearts, perhaps in some way, about what's going to happen. What's going to happen now? But there was no dramatic, intense confrontation with authorities. There was no insurrection. There was no revolution. There was no storming the capital. All of this build-up, all of this celebration, all of this declaration of his kingship, fanfare and royal decree, simply for Jesus to look around the temple and leave. It's interesting. Why does he do that? Why such an anticlimax almost? In part, we see the reason for that in the unfolding verses in Mark 11, the next day. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus enters the temple again. But Jesus is not a visitor to the temple, friends. He's not a visitor to the temple. He's not a tourist impressed by the gold, the white marble, the enormous stones. He doesn't come out of even some pious religious observance offering prayers or sacrifice. The next day, as we know, Jesus enters the temple, fulfilling prophecy declared by Malachi, which says, suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will make, uh, he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Jesus enters the temple, friends, to inspect it, not to simply restore it, but pronounce God's judgment on those who are corrupting it. Who are corrupting it. Is it not written that my, in my father's house, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When Jesus comes, friends, he comes to save us from ourselves. He comes to save us from ourselves. Just as it was for the people who lined the streets into Jerusalem then, we too need saving from our allegiance to human categories that divides the world into enclaves that sets one against the other. This, this week, uh, the world around us as well celebrated Harmony Week. I don't know if you know that. Harmony Week. This idea about how we, how we have relationship with each other, with people of difference, with people of difference. Jesus, friends wants to save us from the way that we enclave ourselves, the way that we separate ourselves, the way, where, that we define ourselves in contrast and we, be, we live divided, alienated. The one who comes in Jerusalem comes as a king for the entire world and dies for the salvation of all people. It's a truth that I think that we readily sit with intellectually, you know, maybe we can identify within our hearts, but how does that translate to our lives? For the people then, this was a real conflict. So Jesus has come to even redeem the, the, the Romans. You know? <laughs> that was the furthest thing from any of the guys from Bethany's mind. Jesus has come to maybe save the Romans too. Hosanna, Lord, save us. Jesus saves us from the fickleness of our faith, friends. Faith that abandons him at the first sight of trouble. Faith where we celebrate one day at the entry point of Jerusalem. Then we struggle to pray with Jesus in the dark garden of Gethsemane the next. Our fickleness where we flee altogether from the anguish and pain of Golgotha. Jesus' call is about endurance, even in the face of unspeakable suffering. Hosanna, Lord, save us. Jesus, save us from the distorted expectations of glory and power. God is not victorious through the might of armies. God is not victorious through the might of armies, but through a king who rides on a donkey, a king who washes feet, a king who gives his life for others on a cross. Jesus says to us, I've come to deal with your real bondage and slavery, to give you utter and complete freedom from sin and death. So what is sin? I heard this quote, that sin is the servants putting themselves in place of the king. 
Sin ultimately is the servants, each of us, putting ourselves in the place of the king. Salvation is the king putting himself in the place of a servant. Hosanna, save us. Friends, Jesus forgives us. Jesus forgives us. I'm going to invite the musos up. May we thank God this morning that Jesus came as a gentle king. May we thank God that he has taken our place, that he has endured our death so that we might live. May we know today that Jesus is king. And may we declare him as king. May we live as if Jesus is king. If he's not king of all, he's not king at all. Hosanna, save us. You know, when we think about Good Friday this week and the focus is on the veil that is torn, we're going to unpack what it means to be free in Jesus. We're going to unpack what it means to be free in Jesus. And I don't think you would be human sometimes to struggle with having a faith that endures great suffering. When Jesus enters in this moment, when he inspects the temple, he is calling people to a greater revelation about who he is. That we would be people in the midst of unthinkable circumstances who remain faithful, who know what it means to live free. We're going to pray. We're going to sing this song. And as we worship, I want to encourage you, friends. I want to encourage you. What do you need saving from today? What inhibits, what keeps you bound? What limits and diminishes your faith and your devotion and your commitment to a God who just longs for you to submit? Because when you do that, when you submit to the power of God, You know, the incredible thing is that power is unlocked, unleashed. It's not about rhetoric, the name of Jesus. It's not about rhetoric. It's about submitting to the power of God. And when you do that, you find freedom and fullness. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. In these moments, I encourage you to pray. What is it that you need saving from? Hosanna, save us. Sometimes, save us from ourselves.
Let's pray. Jesus, that's our heart's cry today. Hosanna, save us. King of all kings. Lord, what does that mean for us today? What do we need saving from? Lord, you know the concerns of our hearts. You know the things that we desire that we've we've longed for. But more than all of those things, as we lay them before you, more than all of that, Jesus, may we see you for who you truly are. May we believe in you for who you truly are. King of all kings, Hosanna, save us. And sometimes, Jesus, save us from ourselves. Lord, as you inspect the temples of our lives today. What do you see? What do you see? Lord, we want to be a people that allows you in complete humility to rearrange it all, to topple it all, God, so that we might be found faithful to you. Gentle King, thank you, Jesus, today that you do indeed save us. You do indeed save us. May we continue to embrace this salvation reality, the fullness of life that you want for each of us. May we walk in that, God, for the sake of others, a world who's crying out to see your people, your church, not only declaring with their their mouths in worship, Hosanna, King of kings, Lord, save us, but a people who live that, every moment of every day in such a radical way that others will come forth from the deepest, darkest places to receive the salvation of Jesus. God, we thank you today that you do indeed save us. As we journey, as we reflect upon the next, the next days, the next chapter, of this incredible story about a God who does so much. May we ourselves be open to the freedom and fullness that you want to bring to each of our lives in your precious and holy name. We pray. Amen. Amen. It's been beautiful to worship together this morning. We're going to sing our final song together. As we go out, we sing the words that say, You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies, only you, Lord. Let's um, take these words into our week as we walk with God into um, Holy Week, into reflecting on our Saviour and what He's done for us. Let's sing these words together. You are my vision, O oh King of my
will continue to bless you and work through you. Amen.